Good afternoon. Um, it's great to see you all here today. And if before I get to my panel, I just want to thank Finance Montreal for what a, has been a fantastic two days. Uh, the hospitality has been excellent, as has the substance. So looking forward to finishing on a strong uh, stretch today. And obviously, big thanks to Jacques, Jacques, Florian, and the team as well for, for organizing, as I said, was a fantastic event. Before I get to the panel, what we're here to talk about today is reaching velocity and transition pathways. And as per the description of the event, the global community, including those here in Canada, are actively seeking to achieve net zero emissions and experts are exploring various transition pathways for each industry. In this effort, financial players and financial sector players, which is who we have in the panel today, have a critical role to play in allocating capital to accelerate this transition. So what are some of the key ways to achieve consensus and defining a clear transition pathway? How do financial players contribute to speed up the transition? What steps can we take to ensure that the transition is fair and ethical for all, including, including marginalized com communities, and within this, the role of policy and regulatory frameworks. And I think this really builds on the panel that Mark Carney was on earlier on today, where he spoke about the whole transition uh, and, and his colleague. We're very fortunate to have three excellent speakers with us uh, as well today. We've got Bertram, uh, founder and managing director of Blue Like and Orange Capital. We have Cecile, deputy chief executive of Tikio uh, Capital. And then we've got Barbara, uh, President and CEO of University Pension Plan Ontario and a member of the Sustainable Finance Action Council here in Canada. So thank you all for joining us. I know some of us have actually traveled from a, a little bit of a distance, so it's great that we can participate today. And again, I'm Stephen Nolan with the United Nations Development Programme. Before we get into the questions, I'm going to ask our panel to describe who they are and what they do uh, within their firms, because these titles are great, but what does your firm actually do? Bertrand, can I start with you first, please? Sure. Uh, as I often say, they have two jobs. One is to run Blue Like an Orange Sustainable Capital, whose objective is to invest in sustainable development in emerging and developing economies. So Latin America for the time being, and Africa later this year, in health, education, agriculture, energy, transportation. So that's my day job. Yes. Demonstrate that uh, even within the system as it is today, you still can do good things. Yes. And my night job, which is the reason why I crossed the Atlantic to come here, is to say if we were to a little bit change the system, we could do a way better job. Yes. So that's that's really the two, the, my two jobs, yes. And I, and I suppose this event organized by Finance Montreal is very much about that change in the system. Exactly. And the guys are doing yeah. it here on the ground. Yeah. Just your previous role before you uh, moved back to Paris. Uh, well, I had several previous roles. I've, I've been a group chief financial officer of two very large banks throughout the financial crisis. So I've had the privilege to add $2 trillion to handle the day Lehman Brothers collapsed. So that prevented me from sleeping for probably four to five months. <laughs> and, uh, and then I moved to Washington, D.C., where I was a managing director of the World Bank Group. Yes. Uh, and I was heavily involved in the preparation of the SDG summit in New York and the Paris summit on climate in 2015, which basically led me to create Blue Like and Orange uh, to provide uh, additional leverage from the private sector to achieve the goals that we had agreed collectively to in uh, 2015. Brilliant. And thank you, Bertrand. The reason why I asked that I want to get the, our audience, get the color of your background yeah. and how you've actually got to this point. Cécile, if you can maybe move to you next, please. Uh, oui, d'abord, je voudrais dire que je suis ravie d'être là, mais on va m'obliger à parler en anglais. Uh, <laughs> I'm good with numbers, sorry. It's bizarre, on est en là, mais Let's be very obligé. clear. Let's so, be very clear. She, she's uh, not saying I'm English. <laughs> I'm Irish. Uh, there is a key distinction, okay? But unfortunately, I can't speak. I English. switch uh, to English, unfortunately. Please, Cecile. Uh, so I've been uh, with Tikio Capital uh, two years now, uh, as you said, as a deputy CEO, uh, also in charge of uh, everything which is linked to... Uh, culture and sustainability, so human capital, uh, brand, uh, sustainability impact platform. And before that, I spent uh, 17 years at Danone. And the, the, my last job was uh, being the CFO of Danone Group, including uh, sustainability, data transformation, procurement. Uh, and it's uh, for me very interesting to have been on the two sides of the matrix. You will choose which is the dark side. Uh, because I think it helps recognizing the barriers from both sides and understanding how you can really uh, remove the barriers to uh, to be uh, together on the way rather than against each other uh, on the nowhere because you don't uh, you don't advance when you're against each other. Brilliant, thank you, Cecile. Barbara, 
Sure. So I, my day job is the CEO of the university pension plan. Um, it's a relatively new pension plan. It was actually its first date was July 1st, 2021, which is right in the middle of COVID. And it was created by um, the university sector to aggregate the, the disparate university pension plans throughout Ontario. So it started with three and it's moved to four and we can talk about that a bit later, but that's the JBuzz. So it was effectively a startup pension plan for a couple of years. And now I'm trying to get it to the next stage and the next level. Um, prior to that, I spent almost 25 years at the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. So I started when it was a startup and left when it became a world-class um, investing organization with all sorts of different types of investments. And I left as the chief risk and strategy officer. Mm -hmm. And part of my role there is I um, started working on governance and ESG and um, became a member of the expert panel on sustainable finance back in 2018 that Tiff Macklin chaired. And um, from that, um, continue my work for getting systemic change in Canada um, with the Sustainable Finance Action Council. Brilliant, thank you. And you know, a startup pension plan. I don't never actually heard that term, but it is interesting now where the world is going. But the reason why I also wanted Bertrand and Cecile to give a bit of their background is on the panel here, you've got people who've managed hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in investments and different things over the last number of years. So we've got a fantastic panel to bring a bit of color to this whole topic of reach and velocity and transition pathways. So Cecile, maybe if I can start with you first, because the, the key thing that we're focused on here today is, or at least with this panel, is the role of the financial system, the financial ecosystem, the financial players within this. You know, one of the key things I manage within the UN, 37 insurance regulators, they collectively regulate 92% of the global insurance market. And one of the big key, key things that they keep talking about is, is greenwashing. And we're seeing that emerge as a, as a real issue. Uh, but within, from your perspective, how can financial institutions balance the need for profitability and sustainable investments while driving the transition in industries with, with high emissions, please, Cecile? Uh, so maybe I, I'll go back because it's a journey uh, on which we all are uh, forced at some point to, to go in and not all at the same reason. So you had the first period where, uh, and it's because you, you spoke about greenwashing, where uh, companies saw, or at least some of companies, saw an opportunity to make big commitment, big, big communications pledge. Yes. So it was uh, 2016. Uh, they were putting commitments that are uh, quite long in time. And as we have a short-term uh, short DNA, it was not so difficult to make because it wouldn't be their uh, execution. So that was the first step. Then you had a step where uh, many companies decided to uh, start a sustainability organization. So they could kill two, uh, two birds with one stone, putting a woman in charge of sustainability. <laughs> so that was the second step. <laughs> and then now we are in the hard uh, core of the transformation because all the commitments that have been taken will start to be uh, checked again execution. Yes. And, and so we were able to see what are the barriers and why today there is incremental progress, but not real transformational uh, project. And for me, that's where uh, finance has a, has a big role to play. Because if you look at what we need to do between now and 2030 uh, and, and decreasing by 55% the emission, it will come from mostly from existing solutions. So what you need to do is really find the capital to scale existing solutions. And in fact, when you look at it, the capital is there, yeah. money is there. The solutions are there, but the big difficulty is how you put that all together with the company that will execute uh, uh, this. And I think you have two main barriers, which are uh, the, the time horizon. So today, uh, in order to, uh, to transform, it's a cost because none of us is able to think about uh, return in uh, 15 years, or at least in terms of companies, especially listed companies. And the second thing is that because we have been educated in competing in all kinds of uh, ways, uh, when you go, because scope one and two is not so difficult, because yep. it's the scope you control and you manage, but once you've reached that, you have the scope three and four, and this is something you don't control. So it's 
how you switch your mindset and your idea from competing to uh, collaborating. And, and finance has a unique ability to help the different value chain and actors to go together through putting capital, making sure there is alignment of interest and proposing new tools for companies to be able to uh, really put, for example, their, their balance sheet at work, leveraging capital and finding a new solution where everyone can cooperate. For example, TKO Capital, we did a, a, a decarbonation fund and we did a regenerative agriculture fund. We did it with Unilever because you need to embark the value chain. And uh, what we do is that we make sure that you have both the people who will um, be the off-taker of the solution, you have the one who will produce, and you, you have a coordinated approach. So for me today, the, the, the biggest challenge and uh, role of finance is scaling uh, transition, putting it at scale, because every actor will only be able to do so much so it's really how you embark everyone to go uh, for scale, because this is what we need to do if we want to uh, reach the objective. Thanks, Cecile. Bertrand, if I could maybe jump to you there, and some of the key sentences I heard from Cecile, incremental progress, but not real transformation yet. A lot of noise, a lot of noise. PR firms are flat out right now saying what their company is up to. Cecile talked about time horizon equal to that too, in terms of the, the cost. Scope three, scope one, scope two, yes, uh, but scope three is really under the bonnet, really getting down to that value chain. Competing to collaboration in the world of private sector, not just finance, but in the private sector, that's not really something we see in all, a lot. And then, you know, balance sheet alignment of interest, but coming back to scale and transition, from your perspective, and, and the, the question I was asked Cecilia earlier on, the role of the financial system or the, the sector, is this what you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis as well? Are, are you as a firm trying to collaborate as well and bring others on because there, there isn't a shortage of capital per se but it's a shortage of deal flow and I, I think we are at a critical moment and i think it's very timely we have this conversation uh, here today mm -hmm. uh, people use and mark Carney keep using the word transition and i think transition is a little bit innocuous you know transition is nice it's like you cross the beach and we sold to people in 2015 I'm, I'm responsible like everybody was involved there and say oh it's nothing you just have to reallocate one or two percent of your money every year and you just have to decrease your carbon emission by one or two percent every year and it's going to be all right and when you ask anybody one or two percent say hey, it's okay no problem no pain and then we realize that even that we have not been able to do so we are eight years down the road the situation is worse and now we realize it's not a transition, it's a real transformation. And that's where it's basically, uh, it's basically painful because you realize that the transformation, you have winners and losers, you have to change the way you cooperate. Uh, uh, so on the one hand, you will have NGOs who will tell you, oh, you're not doing enough because if it's a transformation, it's very serious. So it's very serious, you have to do this at scale urgently overnight. On the other end, you have people like on the south of this border, people say, no, this is a joke, we stop everything. And so it's very difficult for people in the middle, we try to say, well, but you know, we are serious, but it takes time, etc." So I think it's extremely important that we, first of all, we agree that it's a real transformation, that incremental, incremental is not and cannot be the, the, the name of the game. And if we want to be uh, serious about all this, that I'm coming back to my day job and night job, today's system is basically neutral. Yes. It does not prevent you from doing good things, and we are all doing good things, but it doesn't prevent you from doing bad things, actually. Everybody can find its way. So it's not an excuse for not doing anything. You still can do good things, but it does not reward good things. And that's the reality. When we discuss changing the system, this is really uh, basically opening the hood, taking your toolbox, and discuss all the boring stuff like accounting standards, fiduciary duties, governance, all the likes, and that's really, again, uh, Cecile and I have been CFO for many years. As I often say, for two months and 29 days, you can do whatever you want. But on the 30th day of the third month, you're back to your accounts. Yeah. And then end of the story. You have to, to, to just be, uh, as it is said, mark to market and not mark to planet. That, that's really the switch we have to do. And that's a systemic change we have to do. And my, my conviction is that if we don't move in that change, uh, it's very unlikely we ever reach the change we expect. I'm Bertrand, sorry, this is 
forgive me, maybe a silly question, those barriers that you mentioned to making that change, what are they right now? There's, there's a lot of commitment, but you know, at a high level, what are those barriers that you see, please? No, but look, we, we, we have an example. There are, there are plenty. We could discuss three hours about this. Yeah. But uh, coming from France, uh, in Europe, over the past few days, a number of insurance companies have announced publicly they are moving away from the alliances on net zero, the, 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 pro, the, the Glasgow project pushed by Marc Carney. Yes. And the reason that they don't, it's not that they abandoned the objective. It's just because of two days rule and antitrust, they cannot say we are working together to stop insuring this type of product or this type of company. So that's one of the rules. So you cannot have an alliance like this, yes. which seems insane. You, you understand it from an antitrust perspective, but from uh, saving the planet perspective, it's insane. Yes. And uh, as I say, being a CFO today in mark-to-market rules, every, every, every three months or every six months or every year, you have to take your balance sheet and you value your buy-in sheet at a liquidating price, the mark to market. How do you want to project mentally over 30 years is if every year you have to liquidate your balance sheet? I mean, it's plenty of these little things that's like, like an elastic. You're brought back to the system today, and it's very difficult to project yourself outside of the system. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. It's costly. Yes. And I think going back, you know, if I may just focus on, on the US and come to you now, Barbara, part of the challenge here within the US there are several states that are very much going after the climate agenda. Then there are other states that are very anti-ESG and are very vocal about it and are not, you know, are willing to send lawyers letters and yeah. frighten CFOs and CEOs and, and so on and so forth. And that's the, the kind of mechanism that they want to see change or anti-woke, whatever it may be. Here in Canada, it's quite progressive. Uh, I've heard over the course of the last few days, but it takes a little bit longer, but it's quite progressive in terms of the agenda. Can you give us an, an overview of the work you've been doing on the Sustainable Finance Council, please? Sure. So just a little bit of context where it came from. So in the expert panel that we did in 2018, 2019, uh, one of the recommendations was to continue on. We got a, a we did about 15 months of interviews and so a lot of rich input from the financial sector civil society on how do we actually create systemic change or you know remove those barriers and so we said there's still lots to figure out when you write those reports they're pretty high level and so we recommended that they actually create a sustainable finance action council meaning they actually do something um, versus just advisory and we said you know in canada one of the Right? We're a federated state. There's provinces, regulators, there's provincial um, provincial regulators, federal regulators. You actually have more regulators than you think if you had tried to map them. But we said if we could get 25 of the Canada's largest financial CEOs and some of the innovative ones in the room, you can actually have a conversation. Yep. And you have the bulk of the financial sector. And that's where the Resonetra came from. So the government uh, stood up the Action Council, and I'm going to try to get my years right, um, in May 2021. Um, and so there was about a year of pre-work in front of that and really gave us three um, that which became four areas of focus. One is to help take all the data that the government has in these obscure databases, which would be really helpful, say, when you think about physical risk assessment in Canada, like flood maps, et cetera, and make it actually accessible to people to do the evaluation. So how can we take solve some of the data problem with the resources the government has. Disclosure, so this was pre-ISSB, so how do we actually as a group push forward disclosure in Canada from, from companies and um, even ourselves as a as financial sector? And the third was taxonomy, which I'll come back to, and then one, the fourth one is actually removing those barriers by doing use cases. So on taxonomies, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with what a taxonomy is, but my analogy that is not perfect, but it's close enough, is how many people know the energy star rating when you go buy your appliance? Right? You go and there's a label there that says, is it really energy efficient? Is it not so energy efficient? How many people actually question that label when you see it? Nobody, right? Like no one does, because you know that there's somewhere, there's a standard, there's an engineer working on that. And so this is really what we're trying to do with the taxonomy. We're trying to say what is green in the Canadian context, what is transition and what's ineligible. Uh, green, think of it as 2050 ready. Transition is on the way of being 2050 ready, or we need to use these things and during the transition, but we need to decarbonize it, which includes 
oil and gas or decarbonization of oil and gas. The reality in Canada is that 28% of our emissions are from the oil and gas sector in the production of oil and gas. And we will never meet our commitments if we do not deal with that sector and how to decarbonize. So we were in, uh, so I chair this group and uh, we took a subset of the uh, Action Council and went through the details and we produced a report that's on the government website called the Taxonomy Roadmap Report and how do you build a green and transition taxonomy. Most people think there's just the EU taxonomy, but there's actually 30 in the world right now in the state of development because mm -hmm. every country is figuring out is this is really hard for the average investor to do, right? So science that's kind of how I got into pensions and to help investors have a consistent definition you really need these taxonomies in place and so you've seen a, a lot of development and one thing that we are also trying to do is bring, bring that clarity bring that consistency because we actually need in Canada about 115 billion dollars a year to actually transition you will not get that from domestic sources so this also has to be internationally credible and to to actually be impactful as you guys were talking it has to be based in science so the underpinning is one and a half degrees how do we actually make investments that are consistent with that so um, that's a lot of the work that we've been doing and one of the things that we want to continue to do is build actually implement the roadmap uh, the report has the high level criteria deals with scope three has governance and we also want to promote a global definition of transition. So everyone has a global definition of green, but there is not a global definition of transition. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. lots of phone calls with the ASEAN region, uh, Australia, who actually want to work on this as a group and actually create a global definition. Yeah, and I know my colleagues provide a secretary to the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, and that's currently this year, India, the presidency, and Indonesia were last year. And one of the big things under the G20 this year is actually trying to develop a transition finance framework mm -hmm. uh, and they the five principles us. they should call. <laughs> but I know your government's very much at that table, very active, and obviously bringing what mm -hmm. your work to that table. But I think the key thing is, as you said, capital is global. Mm -hmm. And when we look at these taxonomies, sometimes I feel I get calls from CEOs, uh, banks, asset managers, whatever it may be. I feel like an amateur therapist um, because people are like, what's going on? And what's this biodiversity thing? I'm only getting my head around climate. <laughs> And now you're looking for new data. Yeah. The key thing is, and my, my background is as mobile technology in the Irish government, is the interoperability of these different systems to allow them to work, and in this case, that capital flow. So, Cecile, come back to the whole area around capital and what you did and what you did in, you know, in terms of what Danon did as, as a firm as well. But what you now do is, what are the type of innovations that you're seeing be, beginning to emerge in this whole area of finance and transition, please? Yeah, so there could be many. I think we have a we have a tendency when we say innovation to think technology. Okay. And I think we need to uh, think much more broader if we want to manage a transformation, because you can innovate in terms of governance, you can innovate in terms of solutions, you can innovate in the way people work together, etc. And I think this is what we need. So. If you look at finance, uh, there are different tools you can uh, you can put. I mean, uh, we just talked about taxonomy. I think the intent was good. The execution in Europe, at least, yeah. is absolutely a nightmare because people are getting confused between the fact that it's about disclosure and not label, but they use it as a label. Uh, there are things that are very precise and things that are uh, very large, so everyone is supposed to invent his own uh, definition. So I think there's an urgent need to make it actionable and to really uh, support the purpose of taking action and not the purpose of having uh, teams of thousand people doing reporting, but they don't know why and they are not sure if it's yeah. the right data. So anyway, so in terms of, uh, of tools, for example, um, uh, we have a business of private debt and what you need to do for people, and it's back to your question of, of impact and profitability. In, at the beginning, impact investors were the kind of investor who would accept uh, a decrease in their return. And I think it created a, a perception that impact was not linked to return. But the truth is, 
You can only uh, do impact if you're profitable, because if not, you cannot invest. And if you're not uh, sustainable, you will hit the wall at one point or the other. So, so the two needs to be fully related, and we need to for, uh, to stop opposing. And so, in our private debt business, what we did um, long time ago is put ESG ratchet. So we define with the company ESG objective, and in order to recognize that if you manage your ecosystem, you have either a reduced beta or a higher alpha. We had an interest rate which was uh, reduced or increased depending on the reach of this objective. So that is very uh, important because you reconnect value and risk yeah. to ESG targets. So it's not something that uh, that is conceptual, but it's 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 very concrete. Then the other uh, tools, if you look at the barriers in terms of uh, cooperation and long-term uh, horizon, when you manage private assets, you have the opportunity to really set your financing solution in the right uh, time horizon to make sure you do the full cycle. Yes. And so it's an investment, you pass the transition and then you're able also to have, uh, uh, to have the, the, the return. And what is important is that uh, you can really do that with uh, the, the mega trends. So we have that in cybersecurity, in nature and biodiversity. Uh, so I think finance is really, uh, and, and again, as I said earlier, because you have not no vested interest in any kind of value chain of the companies, you can really be the one that align interest between everyone and, and can manage the way uh, the investments are made, but pulling everyone together. Because if you are a company and then you ask investors to invest for you to help uh, uh, sort out your scope three, no one will come. But if you are uh, an asset manager and you're saying we are going to scale agriculture or energy transition, then you will be able to to embark both corporates who will do the, the work and be the off taker yeah. and uh, investors that will be able to uh, really scale uh, the solution. So I think there are many solutions if we want to be creative, but we need to make sure that innovation outside of technology is what we need today to change the system and a DNA where we've all been educated. So, so, uh, Thank you for that. I think maybe just building on Bertrand, if I can, Cecile's point there, impact. And I think, you know, again, as a former policy advisor in an EU country, and I'm showing my age here now, I can remember when Europe led the way on mobile technology. That was what I worked in, right? Um, and, you know, I see there's younger people in the audience. So, you know, a few decades ago, your phone battery would last for a full week. Uh, and all you did was call people on SMS, and then you had Tetris. So, uh, but, but the key thing, it lasted for a week, right? But Europe did lead the way for a period of time with Nokia and Ericsson, and then we lost that leadership. And one could argue that maybe we overregulated or the, the cost of the licenses. Perhaps there's a danger of Europe. You know, Europe has been leading the way in sustainable finance the last number of years, and very proud to see Commissioner McGuinness involved in that as well. But a lot of the focus now when we FC First within European members is very much focused on risk and compliance, and that's really important, and the taxonomy, but as you said, there are thousands of people now who are being repurposed in organizations. You're now over sustainable finance from a risk perspective, from an SFDR, what type of fund. We've moved away from kind of the impact, the opportunity. So maybe if I move away, from, going back to how you're describing the work you're doing in emerging markets now, what type of opportunities are you seeing in emerging markets on this agenda, please, Bertrand? Well, coming back to what Cecil said, uh, I mean, finance is pretty diverse. You have sophisticated people that can buy 100% of what Cecil said. And I still believe the vast majority of people uh, think what one of my investors told me, I'm taking your financial return and I get the impact for free. Okay. In people's mind today, it's, it's the impact and everything which is related is a nice add-on. It's great uh, to tick the box, etc. But at the end of the day, they are paid and compensated for the financial return full stop. And we should not fool ourselves. That's why we need to change the system. That's why we need to value everything that, that would be the, the link with the emerging market. That's why we have to put a value to everything we discuss. It's not free. I mean, it, 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 it takes time, it takes uh, efforts, it takes uh, energy, data, system, etc. And, and we have to stop that saying that it's free. 
I think it's very important. Free in people's mind has no value at the end of the day. It has to have a real price tag. And I think this is important. It's not on the side. We have to bring impact in the mainstream and, and make sure that you don't have on the one end a sustainable finance and the other end an unsustainable finance. We should have only one finance. Okay. And if we lose sight of this, we are dead. Coming back to your point on emerging markets, that's probably where the leverage is, is highest in, in reality. Uh, this is exactly, and when I was at the World Bank, I, I, I was a member of the Financial Stability Board under Mark Carney's chairmanship, and we worked together on climate in 2015. And, and, and our conviction, which is even more valid today, was that the battle for climate, but I could say the battle for biodiversity, the battle for nature, the battle for gender, the battle for inequalities, we, none of this battle will be won or lost in Ottawa, in Washington, in Montreal, in Paris or Brussels. All this battle will be loved, lost or won in Bogota, in Brasilia, in Delhi, in Lagos, in Johannesburg. And it's precisely the opposite we are doing. We concentrate our efforts, our money, public and private money, in Canada, in the EU, in, in, uh, in the US, etc. The public and, and private flows to this country is limited and diminishing. And so I think we are fooling ourselves. I think Mark had, the, had this great uh, formula when we met earlier today. Is if this is not sold everywhere, it's sold nowhere. Yes. And that's precisely the challenge we have ahead of us. And, uh, and the reality is that we have this growing gap between uh, the South, what's, what's called now the Global South, meaning uh, Southeast Asia, India, Africa, and Latin America, and not the North, but the West. And, and people say, okay, you're lecturing us, you've enjoyed life for 200 years, you, you've basically consumed the, the carbon budget, you, you've destroyed nature, etc. and now you come back to us and say, oh, guys, easy, you have to leapfrog to the next generation. But by the way, we will not provide you with money. Yeah. You're, because you're very smart, etc. It's impossible to handle. And, and so I think it's, it's one of the most difficult situations we, we are facing today. It's been seen at the COP last year. We finally created the loss and damage uh, fund, but there is zero money in it. You had the same in Montreal on biodiversity. You, you made the decision to create not one, but four funds with very little in it. And, and so th there is anger boiling in the system. And I think we have to be conscious that we will not solve the problem in our country alone. So we have to find ways, we have to be creative, but we also have to be generous yeah. to address this. And I think uh, I'm, to, I'm taking uh, my, my old hat uh, of managing director of the World Bank. I think this uh, international system that we put together 70 years ago has to really change itself very fast. Uh, because if they don't, they risk to become less relevant and then irrelevant. If this system is incapable of showing the way to the world and say, you have to defeat poverty and climate and nature together. It's not one or the other. Uh, I think it's very important. Now, you, when you go to the South and you say, well, guys, now the World Bank should take care of climate. And you say, but what about my poor? And so it's very difficult. So from when you are at a university, you can discuss as climate and poverty goes together. It's very difficult to go on the ground. So we have to radically change the system and engage more forcefully. When we discuss ESG, it's seen by many as an excuse to close our markets to these people. Yes. And on top of that, they say, not only you, you put norms, but you change the goalpost every two years. So again, I don't want to say we are right every time and they are wrong every time, but I think we have to change the tone and the substance of the dialogue between, uh, as people say, the rest and the West. Yeah. And, and it has to be done quickly. Oh, yes. Yeah. We haven't got a lot of time to, to be messing around anymore, but I also, this credibility issue that you mentioned, yeah. these institutions that have been around for 70 yeah. years, they're seen as almost fossils themselves. They're not moving fast, not <laughs> reacting. Whereas you go to the global yeah. south, the innovation, and yeah. I'm not just talking about you know, the broader innovation and the solutions that are coming across, the energy is there, yeah. but we're actually starving them of capital. That's part of the challenge, right, in terms of this capital piece you talked. One of the things we're also talking about, and now there has been a change in this, going back to taxonomies, well, why don't you adopt a European taxonomy? And you'd literally crater some of these economies mm -hmm. if... No, don't, but, but, but in terms of some of these, these emerging economies, maybe just bring it back to Canada for a moment, if I can, Barbara, in terms of your pension plan. Mm -hmm. How are you seeking to invest in the transition and at a practical level? What are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis, please? Sure. So 
uh, contest. So we launched uh, July 1st, 2021. Uh, when we issued our first annual report in the following year, we actually came out with a climate action plan. So we said we'll be net zero by 2040. So our premise is that we're decarbonizing too slowly, so we need to be ahead of the curve. And so we picked 2040 versus 2050. And we um, also provided interim targets like 60% reduction by 2030, another target for 2025, which is around 16.5%, which reflect the liquidity of the assets that we inherited. So we had to bring in that reality. We also um, committed to investing in, in things that actually help with the transition. So we committed to putting in the climate investment transition framework. We're working on that this year. We'll be releasing it this year with a target for how much of our capital will go into um, this and over different periods of time. So. The investing piece is there. We made the plan to reduce our emissions. Um, we're big on engagement. Um, we know our size. We do it on a collaborative basis. So one of the things I do in my other job is I chair um, Climate Engagement Canada, which is the Canadian version of Climate Action 100 Plus. And we are trying to um, uh, focus on the top 40 emitters in Canada, which if they actually reduce their emissions, we're a long way to what we need to do for 2050 and hopefully be an example for other countries who start up local engagement initiatives because there is no other initiative specifically targeting climate reduction or emission reductions in Canada or in many nations. So we're hoping to prove to be an example there. Uh, we advocate, so we spend a lot of time on the Action Council as well as other policy initiatives. Uh, we committed to joining Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance so that we can also, knowing our size, learn from others um, and taking their uh, guidance and actually incorporating it into our day to day. So last year we made our first new fund investment, which we we're pretty excited about. It's Digital Bridge, so it's digital infrastructure, also very underpinning on climate and hopefully in you know, a few weeks we can talk about our next three funds, which we're also set up uh, to do co-investments. And with this um, Article 9 funds, or, yeah. you know, there's only 29 of them. We really do need more. And I, I know there's a lot of confusion, but without yeah. things like the tax on you wouldn't have those. Um, so we have uh, one of the investors we have has a lot of those. So we're trying to really show progressiveness. We um, For that, we won the Sustainability Pension Plan Award this year from thing. And I think I got called a pension wonk and climate crusader by the Globe and Mail for <laughs> what we did. So, um, so hopefully I'm trying to really change the way that pension plans can um, yeah be active in this role. And a lot of this, you know, comes from my prior experience and knowing the pension community in Canada and being able to bring together, not just um, asset owners, but the vast majority of capital in Canada, if you look at say the TSX is, you know, the biggest owner is probably RBC. The next three owners is BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanguard. Yeah. Those are the people who are talking to our companies, right? And they're all under pressure from the attorney generals. Mm -hmm. um, and then you you really need the other, um, so we we're able to assemble about 37, 38 Canadian investors, so really strong voice to actually talk to them about uh, governance and strategy, have a net zero strategy, what is it, how can we help you, um, you know, how to do create sector relevant targets, um, risk management, their own advocacy through their own things. And then we're actually able to take this, um, we created a benchmark framework that's on the climate engagement website. So we can actually provide data of how the Canadian companies are doing. And we have ECCC, Environment and Climate Change, actually observing the technical committee. So we can actually feed back what the companies are saying their challenges are. So hopefully that can inform policy. So those are all the types of things that we're trying to do to help move the needle. Brilliant. You know, I know I won't push it to you. Obviously, you won't. You've got three new funds coming out in the next few weeks. So congratulations in advance, and hopefully they work well. In terms of coming back, if I can, to seal it yourself, and what we're seeing in Europe as well, and I'm moving away from emerging markets for a moment because it's, we're, you know, the talk about just transition. And I know, you know, just the latest example of my own country is uh, Ireland is famous for peatlands, boglands. And we have a company that for decades has been harvesting the bog and, you know, you've got three and a half thousand employees that are now being phased out because you can no longer be doing this. But three and a half thousand uh, employees that may all have a family, four or five. So suddenly you're looking at oh, nearly 10,000 people who are affected job-wise, but it has to be done. So how do we, in this transition, 
I think Mia said earlier on Bertram, there's going to be winners and losers, unfortunately. So is there a way we're able to safeguard against this or is it, is it an awareness and education piece? Do you have any thoughts, please, on that? Um, yes, but me, I, I think it's not one size fits all. Yes. So I think it's really uh, whenever you, you start to look at concrete uh, action, it's how you make sure because it's back to what Bertrand was saying. Everything is interdependent. So you take uh, agriculture. Agriculture, it's about food. So it's about health. Yes. Today, uh, 1.1 trillion is spent uh, because of uh, in, in health system for obesity and diabetes. And we know it's uh, directly not the food system we built. And it's uh, poverty and communities for people who are actually making the food. So whenever you are tackling uh, agriculture and your primary uh, KPIs would be climate, you will ensure, and it's by the way part of the taxonomy, do, do not significantly um, harm, yeah. you will make sure that you have secondary uh, KPIs regarding social and health impact. So every time you are uh, really going for something, you need to embrace the full scope and not uh, by doing something for climate, then uh, something else is uh, disrupted and, uh, and damaged uh, on the other side. And this is why it's so difficult because uh, doing the perfect thing for everything is not easy. But uh, what we are seeing is that often it's, uh, it's linked and it goes in the same direction. So whenever we've been building uh, building solutions for a transition, you have to uh, go the step of the transition. But after that, generally, the, the system and the ecosystem is in, in general aligned in uh, growing positively for the different uh, aspects. But it's, it's, it's complex and it's also uh, make sure you still keep your eye on the ball and not yes. lose sight of uh, the different uh, interdependencies and uh, part of the ecosystem. Yeah. And that interconnection, this. Bertrand, can you mind maybe building on that? I know in the call we had last week, you were uh, on, on this topic, just that kind of transition and it's just unfair. Yeah, I, I think, uh, again, coming back to my point on transformation and winners and losers, in particular in France, we've been hit severely by the yellow jackets, which was a, a real life experience of, we have a great technocratic solution, uh, we didn't sell it properly, and these guys, they don't understand, and, and that's it. Uh, which basically shows that we have to spend way more time on the how. I think we, we, we agree on the big picture. We have this objective of 2030, 2050. Uh, we, we discuss billions, trillions, etc. So the macro thing is okay. And then how do you land this? How do you enter all of this into the atmosphere? Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's, it's complex because as Cecil said, you have so many interdependencies. I mean, I think everybody would be very happy if the solution was for everybody to have an electric car and that we are done. Yeah. And I think everybody, let's, let's subsidize my electric car, and with that, I've solved the problem. And then you, you, when you dig into the electric car, you realize that it's creating additional issues, etc. Yeah. No, it's very complex. So coming back to my point on transformation, it, it touches on our food system, on our health system, on our production system, on our financial system, our consumption system, etc. So, of course, there is no magic wand where you change this overnight. So we have to agree that it will take time, that it's complex, that we, it's, it's a trial and error process. So as I often say, we have to be, and it's very difficult for French people in particular, we have to be both very ambitious and very modest. <laughs> uh, very ambitious because, we, we, as you say, we, we don't have to, to lose sight of the, of the goal. And the goal is really to transform our economy. And again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we agreed in 2015 on sustainable development goals. If we get there, we are done. So the goal is there. But we have to be very modest because it will take time. Usually, you know, uh, when I was at the World Bank, people made quite often fun of me. Say, oh, yeah, you're French and you think that uh, it's a revolution. So you take the Bastille, you abolish the privilege and you're done. And then 20 years later, you have Bonaparte and then you have Lewis XVIII and then back to step one. <laughs> you know, and the fancy, maybe you will contradict me. People say, Grand, how do you say grand soir in English? Apparently, you say grand soir. <laughs> so there is no grand soir. Yeah. It's, it's a hard job. That's exactly what you describe with your effort. That's exactly what Cecily is describing. That's exactly what everybody is describing. We have to, to work on all the details. Uh, and what is difficult today 
uh, and there are many things difficult, but there is no master of the world. When we kind of agreed on the so-called neoliberal system or Friedmanian system or whatever, the US was a master of the world. Yes. And so even Mitterrand in France resisted two years and then he capitulated. Today, there is no master of the world. So you have competing system, you have vested interests, you have different culture, etc. That makes these things very difficult, in particular at a moment where the world itself is fragmented. It's not that you don't have a master, but on top of that, you have competition. Yes. And uh, I think that that's the, the, the mindset we have to, to change is we have to move from the idea that we can organize globalization, and globalization is basically the pursuit of what we've seen for the past 50 years, to something which I would call planetarization. It's really our planet which is at stake. Yes. And so we really have to, to redesign this whole thing and, and to do this in good faith. Let's face it, it's difficult because to, I mean, the G20 uh, is produced. It doesn't mean that we have to stop. I think we have, we have the capacity, all of us, to do something at our level and we have to push. Uh, but let's face it, uh, let's not fool ourselves. I mean, we have not passed the point of non-return. Okay. And it's, it's challenging, but it's doable. That's the good news. I mean, the, the last thing, maybe I, I was living in Washington at the time of the COVID. What makes me optimistic for the future? With COVID, we hit a wall. And we found the money, we found the vaccine, everything. Not that I have a particular affection for Donald Trump, but he was the only president on earth that as soon as April 2020 said, we got the vaccine by the end of the year. Macron said it, we need three years, everybody said it's three, four years, and Trump said, no, no, we will find it. I think we have not totally hit the wall yet on, on climate, and etc. So I think we have the capacity, you have so many people searching, you have so much money available, etc. There is no way we cannot put all these things together and get a solution. But maybe we need to fill the, the wall uh, a little sure. harder. And, and if I may, Bertrand, I'm going to just wrap up now in a moment. The COVID example that you gave, but it wasn't fair across the That's entire world, right? Uh, we found the money in the West. We found the solutions. We can find this. But, but you're right. Actually, at that point in time, we did find the solutions and we, we went for it. So I think, as you said, it, it's a hard job, but it's doable. I think the key for me, just listening to you, Bertrand, is that, that word, forget about transition, it's transformation. It's really unpacking this. So look, just as we kind of come to an end here, um, before we, we, you know, I want to go to Bertrand, just one last question. I just want to thank uh, uh, Finance Montreal as well, because I think, in fairness, they brought together what a, a fantastic few days and bring us all here together. It was amazing over the course of two days watching people queue to come in to talk about sustainable finance. Uh, when I started in this area a decade ago, and I had a head of hair as well, um, <laughs> you could get five, six, seven people in a room, right? You were lucky to get five, six, seven people. Now you've got chief executives and this panel here and the quality of this panel, as I said, who've managed hundreds of billions and not over a trillion dollars and their experience to spend time with us today. But we have to thank Jacques, we have to thank Florian, Pauline and the guys in, in Finance Montreal. I work with 54 different countries within my UN role. Within them, I work with 40 different countries and their financial centers. And Finance Montreal is in the top five of actually doing activities along with Paris and a few other members. And that's down to Jacques' leadership. And then also creating this framework around the system of finance roadmap which I know the guys are working on right now and are leveraging off other best practices around the world. And we're really excited when we see that pop out later on this year. So that whole area about transformation, that whole leadership that Montreal is genuinely taking on a global scale right now, and you guys don't see it because you're here, but I do see it in my role, is phenomenal. And actually other countries are now looking to Montreal for best practice. And I know Pauline from Paris is here as well, and it's been really interesting seeing the Paris-Montreal corridor around sustainable finance emerge. And hence, we've got two of our colleagues today from from, from Paris as well. Bertrand, can I just come to you, and you've talked about COP15, and we've all seen that picture of everybody standing up like they won the Champions League. Uh, and it's been tough the last number of years, and we had Edinburgh, middle of COVID, we had Sharma Sheikh, there were some logistic challenges last year. How important is COP28 this year uh, in terms of moving on to the next level? And maybe that's the last question for today, please. Well, I think every, every COP is potentially important. You know after if it has been up to the expectations. Okay. But this year is particularly sensitive because uh, it's in the Gulf. It, it's not another place. It's really in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and of course, everybody is questioning what does it mean. So it's going to be very interesting to see how we navigate this. Is it going, is it going to be a way to kind of... Uh, 
fudge the issue and say yes, we we continue on the fossil, but we do uh, renewable and uh, hand in hand, or is it going the moment where everybody realizes that we have to shift? It's a little early days, but again, I think the jury is still out. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm very open to see what can come out of this. I think it's a uh, uh, but it's important, but you have to see this in succession. It's the G20, it's uh, the, the Paris summit that President Macron is convening in three weeks, it's uh, the G7 that happened a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So all this summit, when, when you talk about summit to people, usually people, uh, okay, well, one of the, this nice picture with all these leaders so happy of themselves. Uh, but this is, these are moments where behind leaders, you, you, you have a whole system which is working to deliver something. Sometimes it's working. Paris was a success. Glasgow was a success. Sometimes it's not working, but you don't really know in advance, but you have to try every time, every time, every time. Okay. I think it's important to keep this in mind. See this point, change the system. That's what we need. And that's where the officials are working in the background. So look, as we close, as I also mentioned, we've got uh, Rio de Janeiro and Mexico City here in Paris as well. I've come as UNDP FC Fresh members to this event. So delighted they came as well. Thanks to Jacques and the team. Please join me in thanking our excellent panel.